Welcome to this month's Biomimicry Fireside Chat. I'm Lexa Mori, Communications Director at the Biomimicry Institute. In our organization, we believe that to truly harness the power of racial and ethnic diversity and catalyze change within institutions across the global landscape, we must ground ourselves with the recognition of the indigenous peoples and cultures that existed on this land prior to colonization. I pay tribute and I'm grateful to greet you all here today from the traditional land of the Kanaka O'ivi people. The natives here trans tr trace their ancestry back to original Polynesian settlers of Hawaii. And it's with great respect that I honor this Aina, the native land. Wow, it's been quite a year. We've experienced so much fear and loss. And despite the pain, there have been gifts in this disruption. We've been able to slow down, to survey, to reflect on the kinds of lives we want to lead. We've risen, we've used our voices to demand change, and now we are more connected than ever before. I have hope because we have the tools and the invitation for collaboration to create a truly regenerative future together. Here to offer us a new perspective and ground us in this moment are Janine Venyas and Azita Arikani, two brilliant and wise women who helped us kick off this series in May and who are here today to help us close out this year and invite a new one of healing through biomimicry. Janine and Azita, thank you for being with us here today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Hello. Hi, Azita. <laughs> Hi, Janine. Hello, everyone out there. Oh, this is so wonderful. Um, hi. Hi. Wow, how things have changed since the last time we talked. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And uh, it, it's kind of hard to know where to begin because I feel like we've lived many, many lives since the last time we spoke. Um, uh, I guess I'll start by locating myself and where I am. I'm here in Canada in Vancouver on the unceded territory of the Salish people. And uh, I actually just moved here. Uh, Vancouver is where I grew up. And um, I've moved back here with my fiance. And it's amazing to be in deep nature. And it's strange to make the shift from the US to Canada. Um, the climate's very different. And uh, maybe I'll start by saying that I could never expect um, how much the context of the conversation has changed since the last time we spoke and the understanding and layers and co-occurring realities that I've been invited into. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of revelations and, and work that's been done, but Janine, why don't you kick off as well as uh, in terms of where you are and locate us all? Mm. Well, we're, it's interesting, Azita, because I'm sitting on, I'm in the Bitterroot Valley in Western Montana, where I live, and it's Salish Kootenai land. So we're both on Salish, on Salish ancestral mm -hmm. land. Um, I'm glad you're home. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, gosh, I have been incredibly fortunate. I feel more lucky than I ever have, more grateful. Uh for the safety I feel in friends and family and, and my place and my good work. I know that it is not, I do not take it for granted. Um, I, the, you know, the, we've been well, the only thing has been um, my 70, my 97 year old dad, mm -hmm. I have not touched, even though he lives six miles away, mm -hmm. I haven't touched him for, I haven't hugged him for nine months. Yeah. He's in, in uh, assisted living. Yeah. So that's, um, there's that. I'm looking for, yay science. Yay science. On the back I'm looking forward to seeing him and bringing him here. Yeah. And uh, feeding him. Um, we, Laura, my partner and I uh, ran a campaign this year. Laura ran for House District 87. That's amazing. In Montana. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we didn't win. We got a, you know, got the part of the red route. Um, 
but met incredibly passionate people yeah. and on both sides. Mm -hmm. Learned a lot about that. Yeah. Learned a lot about that yeah. living in a, a predominantly Republican Valley. Yeah. Um, and we repaired and brought back to life, rejuvenated our project. You know, Azita, we always have these projects. We have a hundred year old cabin um, mm -hmm. on, a, on a, a lake at 6,400 feet and it was listing mm -hmm. into the lake and, and we brought it back to life, hopefully for another hundred or even. So we know a lot of, we spent a lot of time with old craftsmanship and mm -hmm. uh, admiring that and trying to do our part in this generation. What a metaphor, I feel like, for it was perfect, actually, rebuilding the house. Was hurting. And we got to participate in it. Um, it had good bones. And we got to participate in, in finding those and shoring those up. Yeah. And uh, it was amazing. Um, and I've had the good work of working on uh, my book, Nature's Universals. Yeah. So I've so been luxuriating. Mm. in wisdom mm. deep patterns that most organisms on this planet have in common yeah deep phenomenon um that uh it's an antidote mm -hmm. to the despair uh, and the incredible free fall yeah that so many of our systems and so many of our planet mates are in yeah human and other and more than human yeah um there's, there's something I know from doing this work, um, which is that life knows what to do mm. to bounce beyond um, after free falls. And that's, and I'm just, I'm, deep, I'm studying that deeply. That's so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm lucky, Azita. Yeah. I also live in a small town where I see a lot of people in trouble. Yeah. I think that's. Uh, I think that's one of the the exposure of the bones. Maybe going back to the metaphor of the house that we live in, that is this planet, the world, uh, where we were located in the U.S. Um, and Black Americans, and uh, just understanding better the terror and the role of participation um that we all need to take uh to to really wake up to what our what you're calling you know our human uh fellow humans are facing and the reality that is very easy to not acknowledge and just move along and when we think about the way things were that's such a different frame based on who you are um and i i appreciate uh the fact that this pre-existing pain and terror and um, a lot of the frailties of our man-made systems are just so painfully exposed now. Um, and those that were close to the vulnerability uh, have fallen through the cracks and we're seeing it. And then of course the 300,000 deaths in the US that we've seen. Um, so it is this, I'm balancing the great despair and grief and pain and again, this co-occurring reality that if we want solutions, we can't go to where we went because those, you know, those places don't work, those frameworks, the who are we learning from? I've examined for myself a lot of like, who are my teachers? What do all my teachers look like? Who's informing my worldview? Um, and I've been working on the new Ask Nature, which uh, has been my silver lining and uh, the big announcement is that the new Ask Nature, which is several years old and you know, was started um, under your stewardship, uh, is seeing a replenishing. And I don't think the timing is a mistake and it's gonna come to life at the end of January. And what we'd like to offer to all the attendees to this fireside chat is a sneak peek. So um, Lex will tee it up, but you're gonna get a link to actually see it before anyone else. And uh, I'll quickly share, Ask Nature is going to be one of the largest living depositories, um, portals, places for nature secrets. And it's gonna be as alive as we make it. It's not a tech platform that is a directive, it's an invitation. And um, it's a call to action, you know, really for us to unpack these 
nature secrets together and see just how many other ways we can approach bridging the future that I hope, I hope we all want to live in. So and speaking of nature's universals, yeah, yeah. And we're seeing a lot of universals in these, in these uh, biological strategies. So I'd love to kick off and kind of hear from you what, what questions um, have been so awake uh, during this time that you're working on. Yeah, oh gosh, many. But just let me just say that um, I'm so glad that you're rejuvenating Ask Nature and opening, mm -hmm. opening the audience, opening the invitation. Um, that's been your, your contribution mm -hmm. in many ways to us, um, is um, to talk about Ask Nature as, uh, and Ask Nature is this database where you can put in a functional challenge, like how would nature heal? And up will come these biological solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to, that's our commons, right? We want to make that available to every, every, anyone who is designing or deciding or deliberating, everyone's a designer, <laughs> that they find that uh, at the moment of creation, they get that answer. Yeah. It's been the missing piece. There's no, there's no time like now for us to get the right teachers, as you just said. Amen. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I'm sitting here with um, day after day of these universal patterns. You know, I, I look at, you know, I'm asking questions like, how does nature heal? How does nature bounce back better? How does nature learn? How does nature shape community? Yeah. How does nature do a circular economy? How does that work? How does nature become generous from each ecosystem giving to the next one? You know, how does nature grow? Yeah. Not just bigger, but better. You know, these questions are questions for this, for this time. And I, when I was thinking about this call, I sent Lexa a, a graphic that is the adaptive cycle. Mm. And there really is no better time to look at this work. This cycle is the cycle that all life forms go through and all ecosystems go through. Um, it, is, it came out of this work by a guy named C.S. Holling, a Canadian scientist who had been asked to go up and look at the spruce budworm um, epidemic. And this was at a time, you know, this was back, he started, I guess, back in the 80s doing this and or even the 70s. And it was at a time when we had this idea of nature as static, that there was this harmonious sort of equilibrium that, that nature got to and that these ecosystems got to. And it refused to acknowledge change. It refused to acknowledge disruption. Um, and those are the times when we were doing things like not letting fires burn, right? A big reason was because we wanted one thing out of these systems. We wanted to maximize timber or maximize corn from a field. And we didn't want it to change. We wanted to make it so that we could continually take more and more and more off year after year. That's not how the natural world works. It works like this. And I think I think it's important at these times of free fall where we feel like they're exposed, as you said, um, that we put ourselves on this map. And so I think, and Lex, if you could help me, let me just describe the, the system to you first. The orange thing is the, is the for loop it's called. And imagine I'll do it via a forest. It starts, you know, as seedlings, right? And it, they're growing. And then there's a long period in which they grow into maturity and then you have a large forest, okay? And in that old forest, um, you've got lots of change within it, but there comes a time when there's so much, new, so many nutrients and biomass are caught up in those trees and in, in what's above the ground as well as below the ground. But there's a lot of nutrients and a lot of network. There's close, close networks and connections. And there is 
um, it becomes exposed to, to, it becomes brittle. It becomes brittle at that point. Um, and that's when a fire happens. That's when pests come in, his spruce, spruce budworms, right? And that, which is sometimes called collapse. In fact, in this chart, it was called collapse. But it's also called release. We changed it because the system, the forest might fall prey to fire or to bugs. But what that does is it releases all this, all these nutrients into ash, right? There's all this stuff that was locked up, basically. If this sounds familiar, you know, when we think about our systems becoming so rigid, yeah, and so monopolistic and so autocratic and so connected up at the top with networks of privilege yes. and money being caught up in a place where it's not trickling down, it's not yes. circulating. I, I believe with seeing, seeing that, seeing our presidency, you know, seeing what could happen, we finally saw that. And then people getting out in the streets and saying, here are the fissures, here are the cracks. We wanna molt, we want release. We want these systems, not just to incrementally repair, but to release. Amen. Yep. We are in that phase right now. It's the most confusing, frightening phase. If you feel that way, that's normal. Yeah. But it is also the loop, that's called the back loop, the blue one. The back loop is the time of most opportunity. And it's when we actually get to reorganize, we go to renewal or to reorganization. We get to take what happens when all of these resources are released. Mm. So now you have a new administration, which we really have to start to participate in how those things are gonna get released, those resources that have been tied up or put towards a certain ass, a certain lobe of society, they're going to be they're going to be freed up. But how are we going to use not just money, people? Yeah. When people lose jobs like they have during this pandemic, they are actually available to take that next loop, which is that renewal loop. That's where all the reorganization goes on. Mm -hmm. That's where you start to reorganize. This is when a forest comes back may not come back exactly the same after the fire, but it does come back and it reorganizes itself. And then it goes into this slower growth and maturity. You know, interestingly, very little sociological research or scientific research has been focused on that blue back loop. And that's us right now. And it's where most participation needs to happen. Right. That's where you really have to lean in during yeah. this phase. And it's quick. It usually happens quickly. Once we get reorganized and we get new feedback loops in place and new rules and new structures in place, flow structures, then we're gonna grow, grow that. Yeah. That's what happens. I am blown away when you first showed this because um, I think when we get myopic of where we are right now, it's very easy to feel hopeless and wherever you are on the privilege chain, um, that helplessness and hopelessness is of course exasperated. Um, and what this grafted for me, and I kind of dug into C.S. Hollings work after you brought it up and he said something about the science of surprise and this deliberate chaos and uh, disorder and how we participate in this moment changes the flow structure of what happens next. And last time we talked about donut economics and our economic systems and how they are just created for saturation and not for uh, proper flow and distribution. Um, and everything that we need to be resourced as human beings we're seeing is not moving. And when it's not moving, things crack and we're seeing the cracks. And what I appreciated about this chart is we're kind of exactly where we're supposed to be based on our behaviors. The decisions that we've made landed us exactly where we're supposed to be. And that's both really uh, daunting and it's really, for me, it was actually relieving 
because it means that based on our will and participation, there's somewhere to grow, go, grow. Yeah. And same. Um, so would you say, I think how much, I think we defer sometimes to like the institutions and obviously those institutions don't always uh, and often don't serve the masses. Um, hopefully this new administration in the US will, will do some repair, but how much can we actually as individual human organisms change the pathway moving forward? How much of our will, especially seeing the bifurcation um, that's happening globally right now, surely not in, just in the US. Yeah. Well, let me show you that chart again and then I'll show you a different one. Lex could, let me see the, um, the first chart here. Because I'll show you something that they don't know, you don't always talk about in that chart. I'm not sure if she can. Lex, can you can you show yep. that first chart again? You're pulling it up. Sorry, Janine. Okay. The um, there's a little piece on that chart I wanna I wanna show you. It's way on the left. You see that little blue thing right there? Uh-huh. <laughs> that's called the exit loop. And that's that's collapse. When you get to this point of renewal where you're reorganizing everything, it's actually, it's a very alive time. It's also a very, it's often dilutely resourced. Um, this is when all the things we've all been working on, all those little demonstration projects, they have to come to the fore and have to be part on the table as, is this how we're gonna put our, put our new society back together again, right? Mm. But that little tail is collapse. Mm. systems when they get to this level of energy they it's like a boiling pot of water you know if they don't reorganize into those 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 beautiful vortexes that occur that's a reorganization to handle the energy you either reorganize into new systems or you collapse mm. and so without participation right Every voice needs to be at the table. And I mean every voice. I mean the Republican voices in my valley and the Democratic voices in my valley and the independent voices and those who don't see themselves as even part of this, right? We Participation, not just locally, but participation in the huge global cycles, the carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. We have to participate in it in a conscious way meaning that we don't monkey wrench it, we participate in a beneficial way. The oxygen cycle, the water cycle, we participate in these and we have to be conscious, I think conscious about participation. It's the most important time. Now, there's, there's another, should I show, I'll, let me show this next, what's called the panarchy. Sure. Which shows you that your participation at one scale is super important on other scales. This is um, Daniel Christian Walls. Um, there's a great book called Design, Designing Regenerative Cultures. And he drew these. This is panarchy. Again, it's from C.S. Holling. It's from how ecosystems work. It's biomimetic. Um, the, there are many cycles going on. And they're going on at different scales and different time frames. So the local one is going on, then you're, there's regional one, it impacts the local one, mm -hmm. the global one. Like if you're in a region and you're doing work in that middle part, just imagine that you're embedded in the global and there are systems embedded, there's little cities and municipalities embedded in the regional, right? And you affect each other. And one of the, two of the cool ways that you can affect each other is that as a system is changing, the, the say you're down at that lower, put your cursor down at that lower one. Say you're doing this, this local thing, you're on the streets, you know, BLM on the streets. And as that other system above you is changing, you, re, it's called revolt. You actually participate at the level of their conservative phase where they're starting to break down, right? You yeah. participate there and you give your ideas there. By the same token, you do not 
when you change things in the natural world, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right. There's this huge loop of remembering from old things that worked. So when a forest burns, the remembering loop that comes from the larger system around it, all the seeds that are in the bank, seed bank, all the seeds that come in, all the organisms that pour in, that comes from these, this little, you know, you're in a forest, but you're in a watershed and the watershed remembers, right? It brings in all these things that you need in order to regrow. We're at that time when we're like, what do we want to revolt and change? But what do we want to remember that was good? Right. And, and, and when it comes to remembering, uh, Janine, I just want to like asterisk this, remembering what was good, the deep remembering, the great turning, um, the indigenous knowledge of remembering, I think is so essential to this. And we spoke about it in our last fireside chat, but it's, it's so essential to keep bringing up that the deep essential remembering of many of the tribal nations that were here before us, um, how can we also surface that intelligence and celebrate the diversity of those individuals as we move into the next loop. Absolutely. Thanks, Lex. I, that's, that's good. Got you guys, we just wanted to turn you on to this a little, little bit or bring it back into your, into your knowledge bank. It's a good map at this time. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, 25% of the planet ha is um, in the hands of indigenous peoples. And those systems are not, are, are not as frayed frankly, as our domesticated, you know, systems are. And their knowledge of what the land teaches them about those cycles and about what, you know, they're remembering <laughs> loop, it comes from no, of, of, of not just resilience thinking, but dwelling. Mm. You dwell in a place. The land teaches you. I know this, living on this piece of land for 30 years and, and um, there's, you're the student and you get, you get taught and you get, you learn patterns over time. And that's what many indigenous peoples are, are holding mm -hmm. right now, preciously holding in their languages, which are going extinct and in their life ways. And the, Biomimicry is very much about bringing to Western industrial culture has lost many of our connections. So biomimicry and things like Ask Nature, where that, where those best practices, those wisdom teachings are put into, into one place sure. right? so that we can. So during this very busy back loop, we're bringing, you know, we're, we're bringing, um, our elders remembering loop right in when we need it. Yeah. Um, and I can't, I cannot emphasize how important that is because as we talked about last time, there's this thing, human exceptionalism, yeah. where we really do think if we think hard enough, we can figure this out ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And just, um, uh, this is, it's not, we don't have time for that. We have to go yeah. directly to source. And Janine, I, uh, I've been thinking a lot about, um, as you know, uh, I was on the early advisory board for the Center for Humane Technology and um, quick background, I had a social media agency. I was involved very early and then I watched the fabric. And if we look at geography as, as a place where we spend a lot of our time uh, when we think of place shaping who we are as biological organisms, the internet is a place that the most of the human population is participating in. And that geography of the internet is shaping us. And most of the people attending today are, you know, in the same ish uh, bubble of interest and probably values alignment in some ways. And um, yet there's this enormous bifurcation and disruption in truth telling. And you said something really uh, important the last time we kind of spoke, you said, um, all life runs on two things to survive, 
sunlight and clear signals of communication. So when it comes to not thinking our way out of this mess, if our thinking is informed by misinformation, what is that doing to us um, as a species to even begin to mend? It's not like we're unaffected uh, and we can share information and properly change each other's minds through clear signaling. What if we, we don't even have access um, the way that without these static signals uh, through social media and the news and otherwise? No, it's, you're absolutely right. It's one of the things that, that for, as a biomimic, it bothers me the most is the, the, um, the deception and the, and the, the, the blurring of between truth and, and uh, what is fact. Um, and well, it's, we're not even there. We're in alternate reality where alternate realities are being created and the people who believe them are, you know, that's, that's what is directing how they behave. I mean, if you really want to understand why people are so mad and holding Trump signs, I mean, go and listen to their reality. And you can get a logic from that. Absolutely. Yeah. That is frightening. And there, there's a larger logic. And biomimicry does get me in touch with that. Mm. That if there's something that we all, all organisms have in common, then all political parties also have it in common. And that sort of understanding our common um, what we're here to do, which is continuity of life, mm. right? And what is important. And I thought, ah, the pandemic will do this. Ah, climate change will do this, right? We'll, we'll all agree that there's this important thing we're working on together, Yeah. right? And um, so that's the saddest, that's the saddest thing. And I think it's a rift that mm. we need to repair. I mean, this, when we talk about information in the natural world, it's feedback signals. Yeah. It's like, if I signal to you as a mutualist, you know, I'm going, I'm signaling, you know, a flower signals to a bee that there's nectar in here. And if the bee comes in and there's no nectar, right? That bee has lost a lot of its energy. The flower won't get pollinated next time because there's a remembering of, there's a reputation which has to do with how, clear and true those signals were there's some deception in primates you know they play some games but i mean in the, for the most part those signals blink clear and true and the feedback loops are essential there there there's not a lot of crying of wolf right there's so for instance information is so important and the information in your body everything that you've learned your adaptations get coded in dna right? It gets coded. This DNA is making mistakes in copying all the time, right? I mean, it's amazing that we, that we're, that, that we're not, you know, 19,000 times a day about you're making a DNA mistake. And organisms, I mean, um, uh, as, uh, enzymes rush in and repair that. Why? Because that information needs to be blinking clear and true. That just blew my mind. I don't know about anyone else. I just had to say. Yeah, okay. it's, a, it's an amazing, it's happening right now as we right. speak. So yeah, 19,200 times. So almost 20,000 times a day. One out of five of your cells today will get cancer. Hmm. And other cells will come in and say, uh-uh, that's not supposed to be happening and repair, right? So a thousand times a year, we get the most dreaded disease, but we don't because there's repair. And that repair, we talked about it last time about cells, they actually flock like birds to a, to a wound. Mm. You know, they, they act like flocking birds, the cells that close your wound. How do they pull that skin together? They, they found that they're like flocking birds. There's so many mechanisms. A lot of your genetic endowment goes towards repair mechanisms. And a lot of it is, to, is, is dependent on the, 
the feedbacks in your body saying, mm -hmm. hey, something's not right here. You know, we call it homo homeostasis. It's the most underrated thing in the world. This, this mm -hmm. idea that something's wrong. You know, even, even your feelings are mental deputies of this, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not feeling well. And then that signal blinking clear and true marshals your whole body to come in and fix that. So this idea that we're either blocked from people's pain that they're talking about, or there's this disinformation campaign that, that makes that hazy. It's one of the most important things we need to do to, to, uh, to work on. Yeah. We really do. It's to, get, to get a common link, to get a common understanding of how the world works. That's what we're trying to do with biomimicry. This is really how the world, the real world works. And then to have us also have a common understanding, a collective nod about where we are right now you know, on our planet, mm. what we need to do together, right? Um, and this, this idea that we don't have, you know, even many, many traditions, the faith traditions of, you know, the Tower of Babel was a punishment. It was to give us an, a way that we couldn't communicate with each other, many right. different languages. Wow. Right? Like that was the worst punishment that we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to have a common understanding yeah. of how the world works. So how do we get there, Zita? Oh, great question. Let me, uh, <laughs> let me solve, solve the world right now. No, um, I, I love this. Um, my, my cells are shaking with aliveness because this resonates so much, which is the signal to my antenna that, uh, that, that, that I'm really resonating. And um, I think about the layers of understanding we actually need to be patient to listen to and uh, that we have very little understanding of how we're made, that when we seek psychological safety, um, the way even our blood runs to our head and the way that we think uh, gets myopic. So the oversimplification um, and the seeking of simplified information is actually a neuro neurological response in a lot of ways to seeking safety. And mm. uh, so it's no, again, going back to like, it's not surprising any of this is happening. There's very real biological safety people are facing, um, add to that psychological terror. And then there's under uh, underdwelling of, individuals all over that feel lost or alone or not heard and you see that self-organization of their a signal of saying hey me too me too um on both sides on both sides and that's that's the thing that we really need to grapple with is the cultural complexity the psychological complexity this isn't just a uh, biomimicry design of here's the design we can solve it now follow nature yeah. We as the engineers, um, regardless of what we are engineering, need to understand where these motivations and how we work is also participating into this. And that's why I love with biomimicry that it's the triplicate of ethos reconnect and emulate because it's not just copy nature and let's make our way out of here. Um, there's a clarifying of the human signal that really needs to happen. And Jaron Lanier, who's a futurist and was in the um, Social Dilemma documentary on Netflix, he essentially, one of his antidotes to, to the social dilemma, the technology dilemma uh, that we're in said, enough people have to actually get off for long enough to clarify their signal, almost reorganize to even be able to detect properly. That's how fried we are in some That's way. Right. Yeah, that's right. You know, that to the extent that we're privileged enough to have used this time as a pause, as a step back, mm -hmm. as you say, um, not a setback, but a step back. To the extent that we were able to do that and take a breath, I think it has been a, a really, really, really good thing because it is a break in, it can be a break in that static. When we were running so fast with, with, with absolute um, 
we got ourselves into a situation where we believed that there weren't even 24 hour cycles. I work mm -hmm. with a lot of people in business and they're just always running and chasing the sun. They work all the time because there's somebody on the other side of the world that needs something. And they're, you know, to that, that sort of, that doesn't allow you to have the, the reset mm -hmm. that allows you to reorganize your thoughts. Think of that adaptive cycle with our ideas. And that we're up at that K level, that, that, that level where all of this information is, is held and we think we have to always be on it and to just let it go and then start to pick what we want, right? Mm -hmm. In that adaptive cycle of renewal, what information streams do you want? Who do you want to be your teachers? We have that opportunity to do it now because we took, we took a pause. The importance of rest is amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very shamed in our culture to say you're going to do nothing. You know, you look at the words in the dictionary for do nothing and you've got, you know, you've got uh, lazy and ne'er-do-well, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> you've got doing nothing, right? But then in the natural world, you've got hibernation, mm -hmm. you've got sleep, torpor, diapause, these rest cycles, hibernating organisms, we now understand, wake up to sleep. Mm, wake, wake up, up to sleep. To sleep. <laughs> yeah. And they, they're wondering if it's that or if it's that they, they need to have a sort of it. They have, need to recalibrate their immune system, which is an information system. They right. need to, to, to re to check in with their immune system. They wake up to sleep, that's how important, and sleep reorganizes this informational flow and, and it, you can do meaning making during, mm -hmm. during this sleep and during things like daydreaming where you've got the default mode network of your brain just sort of not task oriented, but mm -hmm. rather integrating what you've, what you've learned and what you've thought about, right, into story. That, if we take that, moment to do that you can't just have information coming at you without without filter and that's what we've been doing i think yeah. right and we haven't been able to one of the things that the default mode network does is they think it has to do with making moral sense of mm. things that's daydreaming it's when you're not on task but when you're right and it's when your brain is very connected and one of, the thing, one of the things that lights up is this idea of making moral choices. So with the information we have, we start to have to ask ourselves, you know, and the question I always ask is, is this good for life, capital L? Mm. Right, what, what I'm about to do here or what I'm hearing, is this in service of life? Are these people, is this message working on behalf of all life? And if it's not, how do we move towards that? Yeah. Right? How do yeah. we move towards that? It's just good. I want to live in a society, not an economy. Mm. You know? <laughs> and so much of it is what's good for the economy. What's good for life? And do you see, first of all, I want to double click um, a few of the things that you just said. One is the difference between I'm hearing passive rest and active rest. And passive rest can be kind of hitting snooze on life, phasing out. Um, they've got it. Someone else will fix it. Uh, a lack of active will and participation in you as a human organism, a part of the neural network of all things. And then active rest, understanding the role of the slumber, whatever that may be, even if that is the five minute, you know, daydream that you allow yourself understanding. I mean, part of this is back to, um, I feel like we don't have the space or appetite or capacity maybe for complexity. And I was thinking about Lovelock and the Gaia theory and when he first kind of proposed that this is one highly interconnected living ecosystem in this one Gaia and how much scientists shut that down. Uh, and 
back to the some need for simplicity for safety. It was almost too psychologically challenging um, for the scientists to open up their mind even more to how complex these networks are working together. And so in this space that we're in, where the complexity is surfacing, the signals are static, we're seeking answers, how do you stay kind of clear in yourself to be able to listen and apply the energy that is you, Janine, as an organism towards this place? How, how would you guide us to kind of clarify um, if we're each these listening kind of tuning rods on the planet, how do we listen better so that the decisions we make, the places from it which we want to do good work is actually uh, informed by some level of innate clarity. Yeah. Wow. It's a beautiful question. I um the I I think that we are we are an innately systems thinkers. Mm-hmm. And and yet we tend to dive in and focus on on one thing at a time and we silo and back to our information streams. When I want solace or I want to be activated by good ideas, Mm -hmm. by signals blinking true, strong and true, I go into a healthy ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Because I think we're tuned to recognize a healthy ecosystem. Mm. And a healthy ecosystem is one that is capable of renewing itself. Renewing itself. Renewal. Which is where, if we're on that place where we have to think about renewal right now, for me, I go in and I literally, and you've been with me sometimes during these things where you go to a place, especially go to a place that's just had a fire if you're in California or in Australia, go to a place that's healing. Actively healing in the state of- Go to a place that's healing. Watch what's happening. Watch how the soil that was exposed is is being clothed by vegetation and by roots. Watch how life is coming back and holding, trying to recreate those cycles, right? So that, so that the seeds that are coming up in that seed bank are now getting nourished. Watch how the whole thing as a network allows that renewal to happen and watch how it reorganizes itself. Just go to a place that has had a landslide or if you've had a big storm, go to a dune, watch, watch it come back, mm. watch it come back. That, I'm fascinated by that sort of healing on a, you know, I, I, I love to go to places like Mount St. Helen and watch how that has healed from the volcano, or I'm reading a lot of researchers who have worked um, in, um, you know, the nuclear plant in Japan and that, that whole area that has come back now and what's going on there, that sort of go there because those are the questions now for renewal for us. So go and watch how the natural world does that we're systems, we're, we're, we're prone to understand systems, especially if we are with or within them. Yeah. Then we can notice them. You know, I would really encourage you to do that or read about them. Sure. Read I was going to about... say, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, um, if you don't have the privilege of accessing that kind of nature, which many people don't, um, I think the resources like Ask Nature, these these free open resources and reading about these things and reading about these things from diverse teachers that that understand a lived experience of healing and the need for repair. Um, The messengers change the message so much that we need to hear. And uh, I, I love what you're saying. And it reminds me, I think one of the biggest differences about myself from the last time we talked in April, whenever it was to now is um, my aperture for patience of long time, of, of big time, that these things take time. And uh, really having to 
shift my understanding of like, okay, in this lifetime, we're all going to get on board with whatever, because this is obviously the truth and whatever that looks like. And it's like every one of us, uh, especially those that are privileged to be able to access this kind of knowledge and applied knowledge and create the safe spaces and resources and safety for others to come along, um, these things will take time. And our, the answers won't manifest maybe as quickly as we want them to. So how do we balance kind of this urgency for solutions and seeing them adopted? How do you see that playing out with the knowing that nature takes a long time to repair? Well, you know, it, it does and it's also a blink. I gotta tell you, I mean, it, it does heal quickly. I've watched a lot of it living in the West here. I've watched a lot of it. Um, and I mean, the, the thing that I've, one of the things I've learned about healing, I've part, also, if you can participate in the healing of a place, so mm -hmm. say you live, you know, when we moved in, it was, this place was like Sand County Al Almanac, if you know that Aldo Leopold thing, where it was just a rough scrabble, overgrazed place. And we participated in the healing by helping the helpers heal. I mean, we just stood back. One of the things we did was put enormous amounts of diversity, diverse seed bank into the seed, into the field to help it and to see what would come up year after year after year. Diversity is one of the keystones of being able to, to bounce back or to bounce forward. Because life actually bounces forward. It mm -hmm. actually gets better with each crisis it's a, and so the question is back to our you know i think a lot about obviously about our political you know our divides um laura just got a call from somebody she hadn't heard from in 10 years and he votes republican and they never talked about it but they just liked each other and he said you know i've always liked you let's get together let's sit down let's i don't think we're all that different. Mm. And I want to start something here in the Valley where we're not talking at each other across flags, but we're just talking to each other. Mm. That sitting down and listening to diverse voices. And I live in a place, you know, I, I don't live in a, a place where everybody thinks like me. And so I have, I have learned sort of the richness of that, of living in a mixed, place a, a mixture and i think in the, going into this renewals phase all those information streams that people bring to the table that come out of their hearts and their lived experience their felt experience mm. and ideas about how they might change things i think that's as that's as important as laura and i every year for 12 years broadcast seeding a different mixture of seeds because we couldn't predict back to humbleness we couldn't predict and we couldn't prescribe what was going to do well in that field mm. because we didn't know enough about what years would be like and how wet they'd be or dry they'd be our the only thing we could do is nurture diversity and bet on it yeah we have to bet on diversity yeah, mm. yeah and i don't you know, I mean, people of all spectrums and all ways yeah. of life coming together. Yeah. There's, and I'm looking forward to getting involved in this next, in this next, uh, in this next election, but this next hundred days, everybody, at least in the United States, it's hugely important. Yeah. Hugely important to like, let's experiment with democracy. <laughs> let's see how it goes. Yeah. I, uh, I'm aware that we're five minutes to time and it's, um, it's, uh, I have to thank Zoom because I feel like we're just in an intimate conversation and then I remember that there's all these amazing people that are participating. So um, thank you, Janine. Thank you, thank uh, you. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for always reflecting such a lucid light that we need. Um, I'm this chat, I'm leaving with more uh, quiet and questions than I have answers. Um, and I just so welcome the diverse points of views and the ways each of us 
actually have so much to offer through our lived experiences. Um, and Lex, I'll cue you to come back uh, and, and join us. Wow. I, of course, I'm always so awed and inspired by speaking to you both. It, you know, one of the things that you had said, Janine, getting a, a common understanding of how the world works and how each of us can come to understand where we are, what we need to do together. It's so important that all of us really understands that we, we do play a role. We all matter. This chat has been on fire, amazing energy coming through, so many amazing ideas and the people are here. We have hundreds of people ready to sign up and do the work. It's, it's all about finding your place and how you can make that impact. For the writers and the communicators in the room, I have to call out that we are hiring at the Biomimicry Institute. I am looking for a diverse, group of applicants to come together. And if you are passionate about wanting to learn to and teach biomimicry to the masses and, and use your unique voice for good, uh, check out the our website where you can find the role for the communications manager. You can also reach out to hello at biomimicry.org if you have questions about it. As Azita mentioned, we are looking for beta testers for the new Ask Nature. So I'm gonna pop that link back into the chat Again, if you're able to lend your time uh, to look through this. And of course, as always, if you feel inspired to help us on this journey in connecting more youth with nature and helping to bring more nature-inspired products to market, you can visit biomimicry.org. I want to leave you all with a question asked so wisely by Janine. As you're performing each of your actions through your day, is this good for a life? Let's reflect before acting. What kind of species do we want to be? How can we look to nature to learn how to embody this intention in our personal lives and in our work? We have a lot of work to do, but I have hope knowing that we are coming together as a community. There are so many fired up people here ready to do the work. And Janine and Azita, Speaking on behalf of everyone here and these amazing notes coming through, thank you so much for offering your wisdom and showing up authentically. You two are just amazing. <laughs> thank you everyone for being with us here today. We couldn't do any of this work without you. So as you're coming close to the end of this year, be safe, go outside when you can, get creative. And we'll see all of you back here in 2021. Lex, quick question. Is yep. the chat available uh, in the Zoom recording after? Can people Part of it is. For those okay. that sent to all panelists and attendees, we can include some of the highlights there with uh, the YouTube recording. Awesome. I want to read through. Yes. Yeah, cool. Me too. Thank you, Lex, for setting this up. And Azita for always being so present. And... Mm -hmm. um, and, and helping being a being a thinking and dreaming partner. Mm. Appreciate it. It's an honor. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon.